You can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad and its gate is wide for the many who choose that way. But the gateway to life is very narrow and the road is difficult. And only a few ever find it. Beware of false prophets who come disguised as harmless sheep, but are really vicious wolves. You can identify them by their fruit, that is, by the way they act. You can pick grapes from the thorn... Can you pick grapes from the thorn bushes or figs from thistles? A good tree produces good fruit and a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit and a bad tree cannot produce good fruit. So every tree that does not produce good fruit is chopped down and thrown into the fire. Yes, just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, so you can identify people by their actions. Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of the, my Father in heaven will enter. On judgment day, many people will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and perform many miracles in your name. But I will, would, I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's laws. Uh, we're at the point now where we've heard the last few weeks the, the Sermon on the Mount is what we've We've heard little bits of it. We started with the Beatitudes, and last week we heard about uh, Jesus talking about the relationship between faith in him and the law, and what that means, and that, as, as we heard when Lynn read now, Jesus brings us away where we don't get right with God by following the law, we get right, right with God by, uh, by faith in Jesus Christ. So the question is then, what about the law? And as I said last week, the law then it becomes not, the law does not define us. Our faith in Christ defines us. The law becomes something else. And I'm going to talk about that in just a minute. But first I want to say, uh, uh, oh boy, I'm old enough now where I can say a couple years ago when I mean 20. Uh, so, so about 20 years ago, uh, a book came out uh, that had the title, all I really need to know, I learned in. Well, you all know it. So you know. So for those of you who don't know, that book laid out really the basic stuffs that we need to know to be happy and safe and successful in life. You know, look both ways before you cross the street. Wash your hands. Say please and thank you. All these real basic things that that we really need to know. Uh, and so I was reviewing this whole Matthew chapters five, six, and seven. The Sermon on the Mount, which starts with the Beatitudes, and we're almost to the end here with this part. And, and it dawned on me that if I was so inclined, I could write a book, and this would be the book. All I needed to know, I learned in the Sermon on the Mount. Because pretty much everything we need to know is contained in these three chapters. If this, if this is all we had in the Bible... Uh, the Bible would be lacking because we wouldn't know about our salvation in Christ through the cross. But we would have everything here, if it didn't contain other teachings about how to live, this is all we'd need. Because it tells us everything we need to know on, for our lives in this life, on the world. Um, and so we start out with, with number one, that the Beatitudes are how God sees the world. All these blessings for people that, that the world kind of pushes to the side, God says, I value those people. In fact, this is a recurring theme throughout the Sermon on the Mount, that the things that God places value on are different than the things the world places value on. And, and we'll see this several times, this will come up. But, but the starting point Jesus starts at is, God sees the world differently than, than most people do. And so our goal then is we want to see the world the way God sees the world. And we want to see people the way God sees people. And so every Jesus lays out exactly how do we do that then. Um, and so he says, this is how God sees the world. Now your job is to go be salt and light. Well, um, the, the salt, really, there are two purposes for salt. In the old days, mostly salt was a preservative. You know, they didn't have refrigerators and freezers, so you salted meat to keep it uh, from going bad, from rotting. So salt was a preservative. 
Salt also adds flavor to food. You know, who would want to eat roast beef without salt on it? The, that would, the doctor has to raise his hand, doesn't he? <laughs> Can we put aside the evils of sodium for 15 minutes? <laughs> roast beef is boring without salt. So Jesus says, I want you to be the salt, that is, the preservative, and the thing that brings spice and flavor into life. He says, I want you to be the light. I'm not going to show you, uh, but I got a big bruise on my leg right there. For during the night, I had to let the dog out, and I didn't want to turn the light on. So, of course, I walked right into the trunk we put the shoes in by the door. And that's what light. Light reveals those things. Light makes the, the world in your basement a safe place to walk around in. So he says, that's what I want you to be. I want you to be the light. I want you to be the, the thing that makes the world safe to walk around in. So he says, this is how God sees the world. These people the world doesn't bless. I really value them. And this is what I want, how I want you to go about being part of that is to be salt and light. So he says, to do that, I've given you the law. And the purpose of the law then is it helps me to know how to love. That's what Jesus says. The whole law is summed up in these two commands. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. So everything that follows, he says here, is going to show you how to do that. Now men, this is women don't even listen for like 15 seconds. Men, some of you are nodding because you've read a sa the same book I've read. Why men hate going to church. Men hate going to church because we talk about love all the time at church. Love is boring to men. So uh, I got a word for you at the end for all the men. So just as you're listening, say, okay, he's going to bring this down to a man's level at the end. So, but here's, here's the point, the very starting point for Jesus. Don't let anger get in the way of your relationship with God. And a second is like it. Don't let anger get in the way of your relationship with other people. This is the example Jesus says. He says, if you're going to the temple to offer a sacrifice, and you get there and you realize you know what? My relationship with my brother is in really bad shape. I need to patch things up with my brother before I become, come before the Lord and worship. He says, so go home. Patch things up with your brother. Then come back and offer the sacrifice. Here's the context of that statement. For somebody who Jesus is talking to up in the north by the Sea of Galilee, to go to the temple, offer a sacrifice, and come home takes about a week. It's about three days down there, a day to do the sacrifice, and three days home. So he's saying, if you just spent three days getting down to the sacrifice, to the temple to offer sacrifice, and you realize, you know what, things are really bad between me and my brother, go home, spend three days going back home, spend a day getting things right with your brother, spend three days going back down to the temple, offer your sacrifice, spend a day there, then you go back home. He's asking them to take a week to do this. This is not you're driving to church and you think, you know what, I had a fight with my brother last night. I'm going to call my brother on the cell phone before I get to church. What he's talking about is something that actually interrupts your life. He's saying, don't go before the Lord if you're angry at other people. Get it right with those other people before you come before the Lord because it will affect your relationship with God. Here's the point that Jesus is making in all of this is our relationships with each other are more important than who's right and who's wrong. Our relationships with each, with each other are even more important than what is right and what is wrong. He's saying, to put it in our language today, he's saying, uh, don't come, be, don't come to church if you're holding a grudge against somebody in your heart. He's not saying don't go to church. He's saying get that part right first because it's going to affect how you worship. 
So, in the context of that, this is what he says. In those relationships, you, your marriage is your most important relationship. And here's a word to parents here. I speak as one parent to another. That one of the most wise things I was ever told was, if you put it all um, into your marriage, put your efforts into your marriage, your kids will have a good home to grow up in. Put your efforts into your kids, your marriage will suffer. Your kids will not have a good home to grow up in. The sad reality is that one of the fastest growing segments for divorce in our country are recently, uh, recent empty nesters. Because the kids move away and the husband and wife sit across the table from each other and look at each other and their thought is, who in the world is this person I'm sitting across from? I don't know them. Because for the last 20 years, their whole life has been going to games, going to concerts, going to parent-teacher conferences. It's been so focused on the kids that they neglected their relationship with each other. And all of a sudden, they, they did not, they grew, instead of growing together for 20 years, they grew apart. And all of a sudden, they don't know each other. So that's what he's saying. Your, the marriage is the most important relationship. Focus on that marriage. Have a good marriage. Your kids will have a good home. So, here's the next one. Your word defines you. This is where he says, you know, let your yes be your yes and your no be your no. Don't worry about promises and oaths and making a big deal out of all this stuff. Just say yes and mean yes. Say no and mean no. Because when it really comes down to it, that's all people have from us is our word. If we say yes, we mean yes. And we do everything we can to keep that yes. And if we mean no, we mean no. And we do everything we can to keep that no. Leave the punishing to God. This is not saying we don't need a legal system. This is where he says, you've heard an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, that the punishment should be the same as the crime. He says, I say to you, don't resist an evil person. They lived in a world where if, if, if your family did something to my family, my family did something back to your family. And it never ended. He's saying, stop. Because everybody wants to be right. Everybody wants to be able to hold themselves over the other side and say, I'm the one who's right. So he says, leave, leave the punishing to God. We'll just forget about that stuff. Because, he says, and this is tied to it, love those who don't love you. When I'm in a little bit of a mood, <laughs> one of my favorite verses is when Paul says, when you love your enemy, it's like piling burning coals on their head. <laughs> when you love your enemy, they're going to know this person is treating me with respect and I'm not treating them with respect. And they're going to know it. And they're going to feel it. It's up to them what they do with that. But that's what he's saying. If you love people who just love you, he says, the worst people in the world love people who love them. He says, what you got, you love people who don't love you. That's a different kind of love. Um, and he says, going along with that on material possessions, he says, give to those who can't give back. Give expecting nothing in return. This is not, he says, don't live, I scratch your back, you scratch my back. Live. I'll scratch your back, and that's the end. I'm just giving. I'm giving, and I get nothing back, and I expect nothing back. That is my motivation for giving, is simply to give because there's a person in need. Because God's rewards are better than people's rewards. Here's the thing that Jesus says. If you donated a million dollars to the church, and we built a whole new wing, and for a million, it would be a pretty nice wing, and you said, I'll give you this million, you build this new wing onto the church, and you name it after me. And we did that. When you get to heaven, God's going to say, your reward for your generosity was, you got your name on the building. I don't have, any, I don't have a reward for you, because you got it. You got your name on the building. That's what you wanted. That's what you got. He says, you give, you give so people notice. That's your reward. People notice. So you give in a way uh, that God rewards is you give without people knowing. 
Not, not that it has to be uh, uh, no one can ever know sort of thing, so that's okay too. But, but the motivation is not to get your name up there and get recognition. The motivation is that God sees it. There was a need, you meant it, uh, you met it, you helped people, and God says, well done. Because God's rewards are better than people's rewards. God says, focus on what God says is important. We, we tend to love the periphery, the edges of things. When God says, no, look at the middle, look at the center. This is what's important. Throughout here, we're seeing what's important. Relationships, pleasing God, all these things. Uh, and it says, don't confuse light and darkness. There's, there's, there's a, uh, we're supposed to be the light of the world. I'll tell you right now, the light of the world uh, can't be angry. <laughs> that, that's the easiest way to put it. If Christians are mad, we, we have failed. We failed to be the light. And, and don't even say to me, well, righteous indignation. No, leave the righteous indignation to Jesus. We don't get to be mad. We are the light. Now, sometimes light is uncomfortable. Sometimes light makes you squint for a while when you're not used to it. But the goal of light is to make a room safe to walk around in the dark, to dispel the darkness. This is one of, my, one of the lessons I always have with the Confirmation kids is what is the difference between Martin Luther and Martin Luther King Jr. Because they don't always know. And so I put them up and I have a picture of each one and I have a, a quote from each one. <clears throat> and the quote from Martin Luther King Jr., I just love this quote, he said, Darkness cannot dispel darkness. Only light can dispel darkness. In other words, hate can't get rid of hate. Only love can get rid of hate. Sorry guys, I don't know what other word to use there than love. But that's it. Only that love can, can dispel hate. Because, here's first, we leave the worrying to God. Jesus is dated a little bit here. He says, none of you can make the hair color your hair change. Well, we can now. I saw someone with orange hair yesterday. It doesn't even phase me anymore when I see that. Um, but, it, but he says, leave the worrying to God. He says, we had enough to worry about just getting through the day. We don't need to worry about the things that are God's to worry about. And this is so important. Leave the judging to God. This is one of the most important Bible passages in the world. This is one I always remember from the old Revised Standard Version I had in, as a kid in Confirmation. Judge not, lest ye be judged. In other words, basically what Jesus is saying is, however you judge other people, I can judge you that way. If you want to be a harsh judge and condemn people, I can be a harsh judge. We're inviting Jesus to, be, to judge us harshly when we judge other people harshly. He says, if you want to be a merciful uh, judger, if you want to be a, a graceful judger, I can judge you that way too. That's why he says, that's why it's not a blanket statement, don't judge. It says, don't judge unless you want to be judged because how you judge is how you will be judged. If Christians would just remember that one verse, boy, would the world be a different place. Now, we need to leave the judging to God, and to do that, we need to trust God. For all that we do, if we're going to leave the worrying to God, we're going to leave the judging to God, we have to trust God. We have to trust that, that, that God will, will do right. And, and here's a good motivation to trust God and to listen to God in all these things. God treats you better than you deserve. This teaches us several things. One thing it can teach us humility. Knowing that, that, that as Lynn read and we say in, in the confession absolution every Sunday, that if we say we're without sin, we're fooling ourselves. Or all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. None of us can uphold God's righteous standards. And so God treats us better than we deserve. And since God treats us better than we deserve, we should treat others better than they deserve. 
Again, love those who can't love you. Give to those who can't return. Treat people better than they deserve. And don't eat rotten fruit. Not only don't eat fruit that's rotten on your counter, but he says, don't accept these ideas that they're the equivalent of rotten fruit. Ideas that, that we can do the things that it says only God should do, like worrying and judging and handing out punishments. That's rotten fruit when you hear a preacher tell you that Christians get to do those things because we're God's people. No, we're God's people, so we don't do those things because God takes care of them. And in the end here, what, what, what I just read, really at the end is, he says, pay attention to this stuff because everything you really need to know is right here. Everything we need to know. And the verse after the verse I stopped reading, because this is, this is the big culmination, I wanted to save this verse for the end, uh, is right here. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The, the, um, I always remember those old, this is where I transfer over to guys, you can listen now. This, I always remember those old commercials for S, with, with the, uh, um, the guy had an engine sitting next to him and he said, you can pay me now, and he holds up a can of motor oil, or you can pay me later. I always remember that commercial. Uh, you can, you can, he's like, you can take care of these things. And you know what? It's going to pay off blessings in your life like you wouldn't believe. Or you can ignore these things and be the person who their foundation of life gets washed out from under them every time the storms come. And the storms will come. We all know that. We all know the storms of life will come. This is when Jesus says, build on a firm foundation, he says that as the summation of the Sermon on the Mount, which is all of these things kind of put into our language on, on how are we supposed to live. He's saying, don't worry about, don't try to be good enough to get into heaven. That's, we, we found a way to be right with God apart from the law, which People had this idea, i got to obey the law, i got to be perfect so that I can be right with God. And Jesus says, no, I've already taken care of that part. For us, here after the fact, he was getting ready to take care of it then, but he's like, he died on the cross, so our sins are forgiven, when in faith we believe he died on the cross. And I keep coming back to, uh, if you want a definition here of a Christian, Romans chapter 10, verse 9, I quote this verse all the time. And if we confess with our lips Jesus is Lord and we believe in our heart God raised him from the dead, we'll be saved. Because that's it. that part's taken care of. All we have to do is believe what he's done. Everything here, he says, all right, I've taken care of the getting you right with God part. And I've, I've taken par, care of the getting you saved part. Now all this stuff, he says, all these things I got for you here, this is how I want you to go be salt and light to the world. This is how you bring light to the world and make it a safe place to walk around. This is how you bring uh, preservation and, and taste to life and meaning to life, you could say. Um, and, and this is this, to, to put it into guy language, because some of us guys here have read this book, Why Men Hate Going to Church. And the reason men don't like going to church is because we talk about love all the time. And Jesus did not say to the disciples when he called them to follow, come with me and love people. He said to them, follow me and I will make you fish for people. Fishing, now I, I got Bruce's attention now. Fishing. <laughs> fish for people. He says, follow me into the unknown. Follow me on an adventure. Follow me in overcoming the odds. See, this is the guy language now. So here it is. All of these things, these, these 20 points, are really that 
They're, they are ways that we can go into the world and make the world a little better place for the people around us. The analogy I love is Michael Jordan, basketball player. You, you, you know who he is. If you're older than, than two, you know Michael Jordan. One of the reasons Michael Jordan was the greatest basketball player ever is because everybody who stepped on the court with him got better. Nobody else on that team had the success playing on other teams they had when they played with him. They all got better. And because they got better, he had more opportunities. And he scored more points and won more championships because he made the people around him better. If, if that was... Think if that's how Christians live. If Christians went out, if we all went out the door and said, I don't need to worry about getting right with God. Jesus is taking care of that for me. Now I can go. And the way I go is I make the world a little better place for the people around me. And I do my best that, that I give those people around me the opportunity to be even better than they were be before I was around them. Think if that kind of a, a sacrificial life, a life that's focused on, on others instead of ourselves, a life that's focused on, on making the world a little more bearable, a little safer, a little more light, a little having a little more flavor than if we weren't in the room. Think of, think of what that would be like as Christians. I just, I mean, it... it it, it just, to me, it seems that if Christians did that, we wouldn't have to worry about how to get people to come in through the doors. Our problem would be, what do we do with them all when they're here? That would be the greatest evangelizing tool we could ever have, as long as we don't do it to evangelize for our benefit. <laughs> If we go out there and just live these lives, following these points, making the world a little better place, it will pay off hugely for those people and for the world. So let's pray God will give us guidance in doing that. Lord, we give you thanks for these instructions, uh, this guidance that Jesus has laid out for us here in the Sermon on the Mount, that, that really what he's done here is he summarized everything we need to know to go out and be your people. And we just pray, Lord, that because we have been saved by your grace through faith, that you will give us the guidance, the strength, and the insights to now to go out and live like this, live a life that, that makes the world a little better place for those people we encounter. And we pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen.